you'll have to forgive me. It's March Madness, and I, you know, anytime I get a chance to talk some basketball, I'm going to. So, let's do it. I don't know why I started the show that way. I don't know. You don't have to forgive me. I, 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 the heck with you. If, if you're not interested in the basketball conversation, well, then, but you know what? It's more than that. We've got a real life story tonight to, to tell you about a Bryant basketball player who's had quite a life experience and is having one now at Bryant University. And so I'm, I'm excited to bring uh, Bosco Coster onto the program today. But first, we're going to meet his coach, uh, Tim O'Shea, from the wonderful Bryant Bulldog program. Now, of course, we're in the middle of March Madness season. so. Timing-wise, you probably have already seen a couple of rounds of basketball, and your brackets are either blown up or hot in your hand, thinking they're going to be worth something. Amusement only, of course. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so we'll get a little thought from the coach as to what he thinks about how that whole tournament is going to do. Here's a headline most recently from Bryant Basketball, and the Bulldogs nailing it in a um, uh, uh, NEC playoff game. Northeast Conference is the league that the Bulldogs play in, and for the first time, uh, Bryant went to the semifinals of that conference postseason tournament, which is yet another piece of progression for your program. It is. It was an important piece, too. We'd been close two years in a row, and, you know, fortunately in this one, we got a little bit of a break with a spectacular shot to send it into overtime. It went to a second overtime, and we won. And, again, one more step towards our ultimate goal of winning that tournament and appearing in the NCAA tournament. It's good to see you. Thanks yeah. for coming back. This is... Uh, um, it's an interesting time of year. Your team is now done, and we'll right. talk about why it's done because it didn't necessarily have to be right, done right. at this point. But what's your what's your overall take about the world of college basketball in 2014-15? You know, I think it remains one of the great amateur sports in this country. And the highlight every year, of course, is March Madness. This time of year, the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, it, 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 the, the health of the game, I think, is excellent. You hear people complain about certain things they don't like, but overall, I think the game is in great shape. Well, it, this is Tuesday, and last week, um, in my role as a public address announcer for URI basketball, I, I noticed a, a, an NIT rule change. They went from a 35 second right. to a 30 second shot right, clock, right. and it may be subtle, but it really isn't. It changes the way things are played. Would you right. rather see that rule change? You know, I, uh, there's, a there's, a in lot the of, there's a lot of momentum to go from 35 to 30. And the women actually play with a 30-second clock right now in NCAA women's basketball. I don't have a problem. It'll speed the game up a little bit. It'll create more possessions. People love offense. People love the game going faster. Uh, th I think the only ones that would be opposed to it is that people really want to play a ball control offense. And there aren't too many teams left. Once the shot clock came in, you saw the Princeton offense really um, be played less and less around the country, the flex offense and some others. I, I'm actually for it. I think it would be good for the game, just like when the three-point line came in. It was a great step forward for the game. I think a, a shorter clock. I don't want to go to 24, but I think 30 would be perfect. But, isn't, Coach, isn't defense still the name of the game to win basketball game? No, you need both ends. I've heard that argument many times, but you've got to score points. I've seen teams that can defend great, but where the real talent in the game lies is putting the ball in the basket. So you need both. You can't do one without the other. Well, the team that's offensively prolific and defensively outstanding, they come together. Uh, which one generally wins? The defensive team, right? Not necessarily. Yes. No, no, not necessarily. It's a combination of the two. The two ends of the floor, they flow one, flows into the other. You've got to be able to score the ball. You've got to be able to make three-point shots. I haven't seen any national champion average 50 points a game. You've got to be able to score. But in the NBA, at the end of the day, right, defense wins, right, because there's so much offensive uh, You know, I've caliber. heard that for years, and I don't know I'm that not going to win this argument. Who I? gets paid? Who gets uh, – NBA, where do the dollars flow? The guys that can put up – the Michael Jordans, the Stephon Currys, the guys that put up big point production, in general, that's where the money flows because that's where the talent is. Now, every now and then, I mean, years ago we had Bill Russell, who was a phenomenal defensive player, but you need – offense is where talent is. And I do think that uh, it, an old coach, Max Good, who was at Bryant, he was a great coach, he always said to me, he could go in the dorm and find 12 guys to come down there and dive on the floor and play defense and just go crazy. But it's much harder to find guys that can put the ball in the basket. So I think sometimes we hear that all the time, defense wins championships. It's true to a degree, but you also need offense. All right. Well, everyone's got a style, and you certainly have been doing something right. Now, in what, what season is this now for you, for Brian? This is well, I've just finished my seventh year. Yeah. In our third year of full eligibility at the Division One level. You know what's nice? 
we're not sitting here talking about Bryant basketball being on the precipice of complete unadulterated disaster. Right. The move from Division Two to the move to Division One, we've already covered that. Right. It's almost like yesterday's news. You right. guys have now established yourself as a competitor in a D1 sure. league. For, I don't know what forever yeah, the, means, but you've right. got in there. Right. The progression's been great. As soon as we turned eligible, first year uh, we won 19 games, finished fourth in the league. Winning season, the next year, year we finished third, and this past year we finished second. So within our conference, we've gone up each year. You know, we haven't got to the top yet, but we've gone four to three to two, and we've had winning seasons at the Division I level. In each of those three years, we've been fully eligible, which is something that's hard to do and something I'm very proud of, especially when you add in the fact that we play a number more road games than we do play home games because we chase high-profile games that will give us some revenue but also some exposure better known as guarantee games. A couple of things I think are interesting. You could be playing right now. There's right. the NCAA where PC right. uh, got in based on timing of the show. We're taping before. Right. We taped last week, so I don't know. Um, uh, URI, I don't know. They won their first NIT game. But those are the two big tournaments. Right. There's a couple other smaller tournaments that you could have been invited to, right. but you decided not to. Well, there's a couple of reasons. They're pay to play. In other words, you have to. if you want to ha have a home game, you have to pay a pretty substantial number. Now we did it a few years ago when we had our first year of eligibility because we thought it was important to go ahead and take advantage of any kind of postseason opportunity. But once you've done that once, you really want your players focused on making the big tournament, which is the NCAA. If we win our conference but lose our conference tournament, we get an automatic spot in the NIT. In both those tournaments, there's no expense to the university to go to. And we've made a decision at Bryant, you know, those are the tournaments we're going to focus on. We're really not interested in the two other tournaments at this point. Um, you know, we're at a different point in our development. Now there are other schools that feel it's important to go to a postseason every year and they're willing to write the check. We've just made a decision that's something we don't want to do. And there's, a, you know, we go on the road for those tournaments, you've got to realize it's more missed class time. Right. Uh, so there, there are a lot of other issues besides the money that come into play, whether you play in those tournaments or the not. The other thing, broad picture, I've been wondering about when it comes to Rhode Island basketball is whether or not we're ever going to see a Bryant, Brown, URI, PC tournament once a year. Wouldn't well, that be great? Well, we, we already play Brown. We've got Providence on the schedule next year. We haven't been able to work it out with the URI yet. Uh, the problem with that scenario, and I, I think it's a good idea, but it becomes a money issue. Where's the game going to be played? Who's going to control the revenue? And I think it really affects URI and PC more than it does Brian and Brown because we don't really get a tremendous amount of ticket revenue from our games, but they do. And so it becomes a financial decision on their part uh, how they could work that out. Be nice to go in and steal one every once in a while, though, right? Sure, but we have an opportunity next year by playing. Well, we always play Brown we've, since we've made this decision to go Division One, and Ed has been great about scheduling us as well. And we'll be on the schedule next year and have a chance to play at the Civic Center. Mm. You've got some nice stories this year. Yes, we do. Tell us about this player that we're going to meet in the next segments. Very talented young man from Melbourne, Australia. Um, was born in um, the former Yugoslavia, in um, Croatia, but he's Serbian. Uh, family emigrated. Uh, to Melbourne after that, you know, that, that civil war there. And he's a kid with tremendous ability, tremendous upside. And as we saw this season, uh, he's starting to scratch the surface of it. He could be one of the best players to ever play at Bryant mm -hmm. if he can keep on the progression he's on now. Wow. Still got three more years with him. Again, potential is, you know, is what it is. It isn't, you haven't achieved anything yet. But he showed flashes this year, and I'm optimistic that he's got a chance to be a special player for us. His name is Bosco Costar. And when you meet him, we'll find out whether that puts a lot of pressure on him. That's a lot of legacy to live up to. Be right back. So Coach O'Shea says he could be one of the best ever at Bryant. Uh, he was a headline that caught our attention. Jim Donaldson wrote a piece on uh, Bosco and him coming over and his whole life story in just two or three pages. It certainly is not your whole life story. Welcome uh, to the broadcast. No, thank you. What do you think about Coach more or less putting up to you that you could uh, potentially be one of the best Bryants ever had? Well, yeah, I thank him for that. You know, um, I come to every practice. I try, try to do the best I can and work hard. And that's all you can do is the best you can. So, I noticed in, in Donaldson's story, it was a nice piece, that you spent a lot of time early in the season riding the bench talking to Al Skinner, yeah. which is you having Coach Skinner. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to talk about uh, top-heavy in, in, in management expertise yeah. on, on the Bryant 
roster, huh? We have 46 years of head coaching experience between Al Skinner, myself, and Happy Dobbs. So it's pretty remarkable. And, it's gr and, and we all get along well. So there's no, um, as Bosco will tell you, I think we play off each other really well. And it's to the benefit of these kids that they have all that experience. So to sit next to a coach who's had uh, much Division One lore was a good benefit for you, huh? Uh, coach. Coach Skinner with a lot of experience. Sitting um, the period where I wasn't playing, sitting next to him was very educational for mm -hmm. me. We just talk about the game, when the game was going along, what um, what his mindset was towards the game. It was really educational for me. All right, so I'm listening carefully to you, trying to pick up accents. So I'm trying to pick up whether I got a Serbian, a Croatian, a Yugoslavian the, in general, or Australian. You went to Australia as a young kid, correct? As a child, yeah. All right, so age what? Around. Even from five to ten, a lot of back and forth. All right. So in Jen Donaldson's story, there was some kind of litany about some of the challenges that you and your family have had, and you've seen a lot. But you're you're sensitive about getting into all the details and and, 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 and the strife that still exists, not with an active war, but still. What do you want to say about it? I mean, it was it was a tough time for my people, and especially for my family. Um, I will mention this. You know, my father was in the military at the time, and it was a tough time for him, you know, for, you ha we ha he had a house there, he had his own business there, and it was just, it was hard to just one day pack up and leave all that for them. Mm. And um, we eventually made it to Australia, you know, and, um, and began a new life. So we started all over again. In a way. So what was that like? I mean, uh, for me, as a l young child, I didn't understand much, and I didn't know much, you know. Right. For them, I'm sure it was a big cultural shock. But Australia is a very multicultural country, you know. So we had a lot of Serbians there, Croatians there, other ethnic groups, and it was hard to adjust. But Australia, being such a multicultural country, it was easier to go there than any other place, I believe. Basketball, big deal in Australia. We know it's a big deal in Eastern Europe. It, it's it, it's sure. become it's becoming uh, a hotbed of recruiting. Correct. Sure. Oh yeah, all over the world now. So, I mean, what do you consider yourself to be, Eastern European, or I mean, when it comes to your basketball, I guess. I mean, we know what your or what, what your ethnicity is, but what? Uh, uh, when it comes to my basketball, I think I have a little bit of both. You know, yeah. I have that rigid Serbian toughness and sometimes the Australian mindset. You know what I mean? So, um, I really don't know how to answer that question. So I mean, uh, best of both worlds, would you say? The Serbian. Eastern European, Croatian, Lithuanian, these kids that are, are coming over here now, they're tough players. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, it's all over Europe. In fact, I, this Saturday I'm heading back over, I'm going over to uh, London. There's a, got a bunch of prospects over there. Basketball is being played all over the world. And I think the, you know, with television and the internet and so forth, um, you know, it's become easier and easier for us to recruit internationally. I get more tapes now on YouTube of kids from all over the world to look at and they can really play and Bryant right now our student population is about 20% international so it's a good fit for us it's one of the you know part of our strategy we obviously look for the best players here in the United States the prep schools but then you got to chase the talent wherever it is and mm -hmm. we've had great success in Australia with Corey Maynard and now Bosco got a young man from New Zealand on the team now and uh, it's interesting how recruiting has evolved and so how did you get this young man well, it started with Corey Maynard. We started, we, we, we got him over here from Australia. He turned out to be a terrific player for us. So we got a little bit of a pipeline going. Great shooter. Yeah, and there was a kid by the name before. Very cocky, though. Oh, yeah. Well, he had that Austrian. The three thing. Yeah. You know, every time he says, do you do that? Yeah, no. I don't. I keep it Good. quiet. Stay low. Stay low, well, dude. I, yeah, it's yeah. a big trend now. Well, Corey Maynard's a great player. Yeah, yeah. But this whole, you know, running down the thing, it's just, you know, I want to reach you know, out. You know, <laughs> every generation has their thing. I know, Sometimes man. Sometimes it's a... And you, you know, and I are getting old enough to be able to it, go it, back a couple it's now. It's the length of the short size. It's it's all their little things. But, you know, it's, it's the young people being young. It's a youthful exuberance. It never really bothers me. In fact, I think it helps us older people stay young, being around that type of enthusiasm. And, you know, who knows where some of this stuff starts, but I don't really have a big problem with it. But Corey was a tough, hard-nosed kid. It started that no pipeline doubt. with Bosco, and there have been some others. But so far, the most successful have been Corey and Bosco. And there will be others to follow in the future because that's part of our recruiting strategy is we're going to look overseas, not for, you know, our whole roster, but for spots here and there. If you look around the country, schools like Gonzaga and St. Mary's that aren't huge schools but have tremendous basketball programs, the international recruiting component has been a big part of their success. Hmm. Now, did you make a visit, or did you do this on tape? Uh, 
it was mostly my former assistant, Mike Kelly, who did take a trip to Australia, but I did most of my viewing of the Australian kids on tape because I don't really have the tolerance for a 22-hour plane ride. And I've always gotten to the point where I'm going to go and I just... I'm just getting old now. but uh, So that's a crapshoot for you, right? To be able to come over, and having not personally, did you, did you, well, but, but you, 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 I saw multiple game tapes. And you it. Skype and all that oh, kind of sure. stuff? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Skype I, I mean, is I, wanna, I came on an official visit. You yeah. did? I did. Oh, yeah. I came with his uncle on an okay. official visit, saw the campus, all right. and met no. the coaching staff. So it's not staff. a complete blind date. No, he, no, had, no. He, had a, he had a great visit with Ron Makeley, who did a great job selling the university. He always and does he with does. recruits. Oh, he does. And he does. He built that place. Oh, yeah. You know, so what grabbed you about Bryant coming over from Australia? Um, first, um, it was a great school. It was a business school, and I like that. I want to get into something related into business, right? Second, I enjoyed um, meeting the different players in the team, the different characters. I liked the coach. The coaching staff was great, and it was just a good environment for me to be in. You know, being at a small school, I feel like it would be easier for me to adjust. And saying that, one of my friends that I played high school basketball with, Declan Sukup, uh, he made that adjustment for me a lot easier, so that's one of the reasons I picked Brian. Now that you've been there a year, is it all what you thought it would be? It is. In a way it is. You know, it's, um, I knew I was going to have my problems adjusting uh, mentally, physically as well, but um, I always believed I could get there, you know, and um, it's really becoming to what I believe it was going to become for me. You get homesick? I do, you know, I miss my mom, my dad, yeah. brother, friends and family, you know, all that good stuff, you know, but... Um, and they get to watch you right on what kind of a schedule. If you've got a 7 o'clock game and you've got an well, ESPN game, you've had a handful well, well, of those, But the right? beauty of it now is... And it's all online. It's all online. All the games are archived. So say they can't watch in the middle of the night. You right. can always archive and watch the game the next day. Right. But between Skype and the Internet now, it has really made it, I think, a lot easier for kids to be away from home whether they're coming from a foreign country to here or from California or some other right. place, the technology is incredible. Yeah, in our day when we went away no, to school, yeah. like we had we all lined up at the phone booth. Like we wait in line to get to the payphone. Yeah, yeah, seriously, yeah. we <laughs> waited on the, the payphone to call home. And yeah, maybe that happened once or but twice. But you went to the mailbox to see and wait to see if you got a letter every few weeks or something. Jeez, yeah. I never thought we'd get this old and we would remember yeah. this. Yeah, like it's that. true it's, though. It's, it's true. You know, what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? More and wake back. Stay with me. You know, sometimes the ball bounces the right way, you know. This was, uh, this was a shot that got Bryant into overtime versus Sacred Heart in front of what has become a raucous student section for the most part at home games at Bryant, which is another thing that's changed culturally over the last right. few years, which is a real blessing for you, right? Well, I think that the whole Division I athletics things has really changed campus life at Bryant. You know, you look at our lacrosse team last year and went out and made a national showing against Syracuse winning that game in the tournament. It changes the, you know, it changes a lot of things on campus. And that game was interesting in that it was, it was second lead-in on ESPN Sports Center nationally. Joe's shot, that shot there was picked as number two highlight of the night. I mean, that's national coverage for the university. And when you have athletic success, I do think that the spirit of the campus is lifted. I, I had that experience as an undergraduate at Boston College. And I think you're starting to see the same thing happen at Bryant. Yeah, I, well, there's no doubt. I mean, it, I mean, it's always been so for PC. URI now yep. is on fire, right. and, and it's changed you know, the dynamics down right. there. Yep. And, you know, Brown uh, struggles sometimes with its student population, but if they're winning, they come. You know, and yeah. it's, it's, it, it, so each school here in Rhode Island's got its own specific culture. Um, you're going to get a chance, and have had a chance, but you're going to get more chances to go see some incredible venues. You open with Duke. We open uh, next year, right? Cameron Indoor Athletic Center next year, November 14th. Their opening game, our opening game. And it's amazing. You think about Bryant Athletics, where it was, you know, when I started this thing the year before, you know, your biggest game on the schedule would have been a school like Bentley, which is fine. It's a nice school and all that. But to think, here it is, it'll be eight years later, we're going to open at Duke in basketball. It's pretty remarkable. They, they, they pay you sure. a lot yeah. of money yeah. to go in there and get your brains beat in. Well, that's not the idea. We've won some of these games now. This year we won a... I call you. That's that's the you know the the greatest win you can have as a coach in uh, college basketball in the regular season is to win a guarantee game. I was fortunate at Ohio. We won two. We won at North Carolina and Maryland. We won at Boston College instead of at Bryant, so we won. We got a big check. People need to understand that. Do you do you follow the business of the? Of the do you just show up and play and do your studies? Do you follow the business of basketball at all? I just show up and play. Just show up and play. play. <laughs> they have no idea what the, 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 the money behind it. He's sitting here going, oh, Coach, what are you talking about? But uh, yeah. guarantee games, folks, I mean, in, in the college basketball world, in Division One, right. 
schools are paid to come in because schools, so Duke will pay you a very large right. sum of money to come in because they need to, they need wins on their schedule and they'll literally try to well, buy them, right? Well, it, it, it's more than that. They need home games. In other words, I'll give you an example. The University of Louisville, we don't play them, but I saw a study where they generate about $2 million from a home basketball game. So financially, it's in their interest to play more home games. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get more home games is to pay a guarantee. So, uh, you know, $100,000, 75, 85, 90, pick the number guarantee. And if you're making two million, it's a pretty good investment. Sure. So there's, there's, it's financially in their best interest to do it, but also from a win-loss standpoint, it's also helpful to the coach. So what's your mindset going down to a Duke? That's got to be a big deal. Now, would you know who Duke was when you were in Australia? I did. You'd we, be following the whole yeah, scene? Yeah, we, we know who Duke is. and. Um, you know, we're gonna go in there. We're not gonna give him anything. Yeah. You know, we're gonna come out swinging. You know, Duke. All right, they're Duke. They have a great basketball record and whatnot. But you know, we're Bryan University. We're gonna show them what we got. What's the most uh, significant difference in culture from your your life in Australia to your life in America? Um, well, adjusting to life in America was it was easier because I had the Australian experience. Like I said, Australia is very multicultural. So, you know, I had American friends, I had Irish friends, I had, you know, Eastern European friends. So, um, it was easy for me to talk to Americans, should I say. Mm -hmm. So, it was good. So, it doesn't really, no, it's it no big deal. No, no. Maybe being away from family and friends, that's a different story now. But, right. um, yeah. yeah. So, what do you think after you get your degree at Bryant, will you stay? I think so. You know, I like, um, I like the East Coast, you know. Um, I want to see if I can get into business world, Boston, New York. So I'm gonna see what job opportunity is I have first. No dreams I make that. for professional ball in Europe. Or oh, yeah. definitely, definitely yeah. dreams to play pro ball. You know, of course, NBA is the dream, but you know, Europe's always. A well, nice the, place. speaking of these these Eastern European kids, not only are they tough, but they they brought a whole another model. I mean, they'll come here and go back sure. and play pro ball sure. back there. Yeah, Bosco's gonna have a chance. Um, the biggest league in, uh, outside the U.S. is called the Euro League. And he's going to have a shot to play in that league and um, at a fairly high level. Now, part of it helps that he's got a, an overseas passport because a lot of teams limit the number of Americans. But he has the talent to be a very good player at that level. But, again, it's potential. We've got to see if he can continue on the path he is. He's still got a lot of work to do. But uh, he's got a chance at it, a realistic chance. You like playing for this guy? I love playing for him. It sounds to me he's not <laughs> yeah. as tough on you defensively no. as he is offensively. You, you play uh, some good defense? Uh, we try. We, um, <laughs> we well, my, my try. point is, I, I agree, Dan, defense, don't get me wrong, is very important, but I always have to say, well, defense, defense, defense. <laughs> well, I had a team at Bryant that um, you know, was very good defensively, but we averaged 51 points a game. So for us to win games, the other guy had to score 50, you know, 50 right. points. Very hard to win games when you're scoring in the 50s. You know what my favorite part about coaches? This. Yeah, <laughs> he's constantly <laughs> when his hand when you're on the floor and I'm his hands are like this. Yeah. What are you thinking? Honestly, I don't even I don't even look over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I know that's natural yeah, on well, top of your head, but I think you've worn enough. it back a little bit too. Well, I don't know. I don't know, but it's uh, <laughs> I'm just looking for where did it go? You know. Uh, that's why I let them wear the hair they like. I say you got to you got to enjoy your hair while you have it. That's funny so stuff. you want to have long hair? Go go. Congratulations on the success. Thanks, Dan. And welcome to America. Thank you. Good luck in the next three years. Final word when we come back. You know, I enjoyed uh, talking with Coach O'Shea. He's, he's a very up guy and a great communicator. And Bosco was a pleasure. Look, if you've got a story of uh, experience that you want to share with us, it's not just feedback on the issues. Give us a ring at 228-1886. Email us at stateofmind at myritv.com or Facebook post or tweet at Dan York Show. Don't forget the E or it won't come through. And let us know what uh, you think ought to be profiled here on My State of Mind. Thanks for watching. If it's a weekday, we'll see you on the radio at noon tomorrow. It's noon at 3 on WPRO and back here at 730 on My State of Mind.